So good evening. I'm Janet Steinmeier, the president of Lesley University, and it's my honor to be here tonight to uh, welcome you to the 2022-23 Thought Leaders Series here at Lesley University. I will say that uh, this series, which is now in its second year, uh, it's, is meant to bring a diverse group of individuals who are in the areas of education and mental health and art and design and related fields um, to, to give us an opportunity to get together and uh, learn from one another. And tonight is especially special because this is the first time we've been able to be in person. So we'll have you this is It's, it's really the result of a lot of work uh, by our uh, event planning staff, who you met on your way in, uh, by our uh, safety personnel and many of the other people who have been navigating this over the past uh, few years. Yeah. I'm really excited to present our special guest, uh, Justin Richmond. Uh, what a way to kick off. Justin, as you have read, is the co-creator of one of Netflix's most popular uh, and acclaimed animated series, The Dragon Prince, which won a 2020 Daytown Emmy for Outstanding Animated Children's Series, um, and is in development as a video game. Yes. With wonderful vocal performances and humor, Justin's characters are on a quest for nothing short of world peace. And the harmony among different that might make that possible. Mirroring the external conflicts between warring factions is the internal struggle between doing uh, everything the right way through hard work and study and persistence, as well in, as embracing the talents and dignity and differences among uh, different people. Uh, and uh, that's different than the wrong way, which is um, because of shortcuts and exploitation. The characters are truly diverse. The Dragon Prince is replete with women and people of color and characters with differing abilities. And I'll say as the mother of an alumnus of our Threshold program, Leslie's groundbreaking program for students with different learning abilities, I'm particularly excited by the writer's inclusion of major characters who function bravely and excellently without seeking magical cures. And I deliberately put that word in kind of quotation marks um, because deafness and perceived restrictions on mobility are part of the characters. At Leslie, we know that the world of inclusion and respect for individual differences is a world worth fighting for. The larger world beyond Leslie's campus, the one not rendered in computer graphics and a hybrid of 2D and 3D visual effects, could learn a thing or two from the charming, complex, and baroque protagonists of the Dragon Prince. So by now, probably I guess that tonight will be a more animated uh, evening than usual. And while you're all groaning about that, um, I will just say that Justin is the first speaker also in our um, Strock Masa uh, Visiting Artist series. Uh, our Strock Masa Visiting Artists are those innovators who at once push the limits of creativity and expand the boundaries of equity and social justice. These specially designated artists and thought leaders are presented by our Board of Trustees Chair, Hans Strock, one of Leslie's most staunch and generous friends, and also the Chair of our Board, Hans. Thank you. So without further delay, it's my pleasure to thank you for joining us and to introduce you to Justin Richmond. All right, let's get this thing started. Is this good? Are we good on the mics? All right, cool. Uh, cool, hi. Uh, who is this guy? Uh, is the first question I'm sure a lot of you are asking. Um, I am Justin Richmond. <laughs> and with the, thank you for that lovely uh, introduction. It's much nicer than I could say anything about myself. Thank you for having me here this evening. Uh, I've been here all day. It's been fantastic. I've had nothing but a great time. And thank you to all the students and teachers and everybody who's had me here. So thank you so much. Um, cool, so how did I get my start? Um, where did I come from? So I started on the other side of the river at Boston University, 
where I studied classics and screenwriting. And when I told my parents, they were like, what are you doing? What's happening here? Uh, are you gonna be able to make any money doing those things? Um, and I made good, so the my parents are actually here, they're in the front row, so I did all right. I wrote, oh, thank, you. So, thank you for not killing me <laughs> when I told you my plans. Um, after that, I moved up to uh, work at Avid Technologies up the road in Tewksbury. Uh, I worked as a tech support rep and I worked in compositing. Um, and it was there I got bitten by the 3D bug. Um, and they were like, cool, well, we're not gonna pay you to do that or teach you how to do it. So uh, I got back and went to art school. I got married and went to art school within a week, uh, which was pretty crazy. And so while I was there, I got to do something similar to some of what you guys do here, which is to make a short animated piece, which I actually dug out of my old FTP site. So I'm gonna show you guys really quick what it was to, to make a piece in 2003. This is actually the piece that got me my first job. Uh, so there is hope for you once you see this. So hold on one second, I'm gonna show it. Uh, let me just kill the lights. Hold on one second. Okay. All right. Sorry, it takes a sec to switch here. Come on. It's coming, I swear. Okay, here we go. And here we go. <laughs> Let's go back to the deck here. I'm back. Waiting. All right, that was the cube of doom. <laughs> uh, so if you know my career at all, uh, you probably know me for one of these two. Oh, is it? Anyway, you know me for one of these two things, uh, which is the Dragon Prince or Uncharted, uh, most likely. Um, but you probably don't know, I also worked on all of these things. Um, uh, Death Junior was the first game I worked on. Uh, I also worked on a game called Big Town High, uh, or Brooktown High, which I barely remember making, um, and also a game called Damnation. Um, I actually have the distinction of working on uh, both the best and worst game of 2009. 
Um, <laughs> so Damnation is one of the lowest games ever rated that year, and uh, Uncharted 2 was the best. Um, so I went from being an animator uh, at Backbone Entertainment, where I worked on some of this stuff. Uh, I switched to design. Um, I actually kind of fell in love with game design while I was there. Um, two guys in particular I will give a shout out to, even though they'll never see this. Uh, David Serlin, who's a game designer, uh, and Chris Opdahl, who's also a game designer, uh, both taught me what it took to be a game design person. Uh, there was no such thing as really a game design degree other than from like Carnegie Mellon back then. Uh, so I did it all sort of after work on the fly. Um, and from there, I went to work on Damnation. I moved back to Annapolis, um, which was a, basically a mod team making a game, uh, which started out great and ended up terrible. <laughs> uh, also run by not a great person. And so I ended up leaving uh, with another designer and went to Naughty Dog, uh, where I was the lead multiplayer designer uh, on Uncharted 2, and then went on to direct Uncharted 3 um, and Uncharted 4, and then I got recruited to go to Riot. Um, oh, I'm clicking the wrong thing. I was like, why isn't that going? Um, I got recruited to go to Riot, um, and then at Riot I met my two business partners, uh, Ernie Haas and Justin Sinis even. Um, Aaron was creative director, Justin was running R&D finance, uh, and we left together to make what became Wonderstorm, um, which is the company where I work today, which is a pretty cool place. And so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Wonderstorm, a little bit about what the Dragon Prince is, a little bit about create, working with creative teams, and then also talk about some of the new stuff that we're working at the company. So. Let's start with uh, company creative culture. So uh, Wonderstorm is a place that we tried to make distinctly different from uh, other video game uh, and TV companies. So we're a little weird <laughs> in that we make both video games and TV shows at the same time with a lot of the same creative team. Uh, a lot of people have tried to do this, but they generally try to do it by starting with one or the other. So they'll start with a video game company and then they'll try to make a TV show or they'll make a TV show and then they try to turn that into a video game. And so what we saw was that failing over and over and over again. And the reason we thought that was happening was because the teams weren't created from the ground up to do that. They had one core competency and then they were trying to jump to another one, which is super difficult. <laughs> and so we were like, well, what if we just cut that off and start making a game and a show at exactly the same time? Um, and so to do that, we sort of laid out um, a bunch of different things, but there's like sort of some core values that we believe in that we think drive us and make us different um, from the other companies that are out there. Uh, and these are not in any order. You could put them in any order, it doesn't matter. They're all equally important to each other. Um, but the first one is that stories and games matter. Um, and great stories and games have the power to bring people together. And at Wonderstorm, we take that responsibility to heart. We wanna create positive, hopeful entertainment experiences that not only represent and resonate with individuals from all different walks of life, but also provide shared sense of community and belonging, both around the world and across generations. So. That's a lot of words to say. We wanna make stuff that appeals to everybody, right? We're trying to make stuff that's great and great storytelling with great games alongside them that appeal to everybody. So that doesn't mean they can't be violent or they can't be have dark, start, dark turns to them or have you know people dying or things like that, but it does mean we're gonna treat those things very carefully and make sure that we're not trying to eliminate any, anybody who might love this show. Um, or this game. And so we take that super seriously and we think that makes us pretty different from other people. Um, the next one, one team shared vision. Um, we're a diverse collection of creative leaders and visionary teams united not only by our shared definitions of success, but our commitment to achieving that success together. Teamwork and collaboration are central to our identity and we believe that no one person has a monopoly on great ideas. So we intentionally create space for everyone to contribute regardless of their department or title and have a direct impact on both the products we're making and the company we're building. And so what does that mean for us? It means that not only are we trying to drive through the ideas across the whole team, that it's not just, it's not my idea, it's not Aaron's idea, it's not any one person's idea. Those ideas can come from anywhere. That means our CTO literally sat down and said like, your magic system doesn't make any sense. And we were like, oh, really? Okay, cool. And so we started talking about it. We realized, oh, we, it actually doesn't make any sense. We're not even obeying our own logic. So. Um, those ideas and creativity can come from anywhere on the team. And that also means that our team needs to be diverse. We need to have distinct voices. And that doesn't, that means all walks of life. That means old and young, people that are differently abled, people that are normally abled, everything, anything you can think of, we wanna have not just in our shows and our games, but also working in our company. And so that means we have to go out of our way to look for talent that wants to work in a place like this. And so hopefully we're attracting the best people in the world to come do that because they share that same vision and want to make the same kinds of things that we're making. Um, so that's super important to us. Um, excellent, true excellence requires empathy. 
Uh, we are a performance-driven company <coughs> dedicated to delivering high-quality content with consistency. We are also guided by empathy. We know that most successful products come from happy and healthy people, so we care deeply about the well-beings of our team. We strive to create an inclusive and kind environment driven by a culture of listening that encourages every individual to, uh, to be their best and to bring out the best in each other, right? So there's a couple of things wrapped up in this. One, people that are crunched or working too hard or just killing themselves to make stuff happen are not going to be the best at doing their job because they're just not. They're going to be worried about stuff. So there's a couple of things that we bring into that, which is being empathetic to people's individual problems uh, in the, inside the company, right? Everybody has stuff going on outside the company. So how do we make sure that we can eliminate as many of those things as possible and be supportive while still getting great work done, right? That's really important to us. So if someone comes and says, I got to take an afternoon off, my kid's sick from school, my husband can't get them, my partner can't get them, how do I, how do, I do that? Fine, go do it, doesn't matter, go take care of it. So that when they come back, they're stress-free, they can work on stuff, they can make great things. That's super important to us. But it also requires empathy with the audience point of view, which is also really, really important, right? So there's a great story about Walt Disney, where Walt was walking around when they were building Walt Disneyland, he was walking around with the architect and they were taking notes together. And every once in a while, Walt would just like get down like this or get down on his knees and look around. And finally the architect was like, what are you doing? Like what's, what's happening here? And he's like, well, I'm looking to see what it would look like if I was a kid, right? And then instantly the architect's like, oh, of course, of course that's what we should be doing because this place isn't made just for adults, it's made for kids that are gonna be two feet off the ground. So how do we make sure we're delighting them as well, right? And having that kind of empathy for your audience is the way you're gonna make great stuff. And that's also something that we you know, really think is important. Next, progress over perfection. This is an interesting one, which we debated a lot about. Um, we, uh, we are continuous works in progress. We're open to new ideas and different perspectives, and we create safe spaces to experiment, take risks, make mistakes. We expect reflection from everyone rather than perfection from anyone. We are accountable for our own growth and constantly challenge ourselves to become better leaders, teammates, and allies, even if that requires hard conversations and change. So there's a lot, again, in this one, but there's a couple things that I think are important. One is that you, you have to make something for, in order for people to react to it. You can't just try to make something perfect and hide it and hide it and hide it and hide it, and then I come out with a grand reveal and here it is, here's my great piece of art. Um, it can work like that, it's very rare, and especially in a collaborative medium like video games or television shows, it doesn't work like that at all. And so we really, really value making progress and making sure that people are making stuff and that they're reacting to each other, right? And they're able to, to take the, make a safe space for them to be able to show their work off and get critiques and then make it better and do what they think the best possible version of the thing they're doing is, not in a vacuum, right? And that's really important to the way we work and the way our creative teams work, where you can't, you're always gonna get feedback, it's okay. And if you don't get feedback from your team, believe me, the public is going to give you feedback, right? They're gonna come in and say, hey man, I don't like this or I love this or whatever. So it's way better to get that out of the way early and make the best possible thing and have your whole team believe in what you're doing rather than just have a single person, you know, doing everything by themselves. Um, and then the last one, <laughs> I love bait. Bait is our, uh, our glow toad. Uh, earn hearts, not eyes. Um, actually, the real version of this, which I will give you, is earn heart balls, not eyeballs, <laughs> which we shortened down to make it a little better for this. So uh, we believe the best way to grow as a company is by capturing the heart of each and every fan, allowing them to become more than just passive consumers, but champions of the worlds and characters we create. We value trust more than views and longevity more than popularity. We reject the idea of using shortcuts, gimmicks, or cheap tricks to achieve mass market appeal and instead put the work, put in the work to create truly original content our audiences and players care about and can build lasting, authentic relationships with. So what does this mean? I mean, really what we're saying here is we want to earn long-term trust and love in favor of potentially making money in the short term or in, in, in favor of potentially being a huge flash in the pan that then goes away. We would much rather put it in some, to work to make something that people really truly love and will stick with for years rather than going for the quick fix uh, or the quick answer or the flash. Um, and so that takes a lot of dedication. Like there are certain, you can very easily find ways out and all, you, know, you can always find a shortcut to this stuff. And so that also means that we have a really, really direct relationship with our fans. We control all of our social media. We control all of the contact between fans and the product. Uh, no matter what it is, and that's super important to us. Like we don't go through, there's no corporate entity running Wonderstorm Communications, right? Like I could get on the phone right now and actually put something on our Twitter feed if I wanted to uh, because we have such a direct connection to our fans and we think that's super, super important and we're gonna keep that no matter how big we get. Um, 
So that's kind of the end of that section. Um, so now moving on to creating a universe. So that, a lot of the images in here are dragon prints. If you don't know what the dragon prints is, uh, I'm gonna show you a quick little teaser trailer. It's an awesome show on Netflix. Please go watch it. Yeah, there are books outside. You can read about it. Uh, we have Halloween costumes. We have art books. We have all kinds of fun stuff. But let me show you a trailer really quick uh, to show about the stuff, and then I'll talk a little bit about building the universe. Of, uh, We know this is gonna take a second. <laughs> All right. All right, this is the teaser for our upcoming season four. Seeing you now. I almost can't believe it's been over two years. to this world is inevitable. Cool. Uh, so that's just a teaser uh, intro to the world. If you think it's interesting, please go watch it. You'll help our view numbers, which would be great. Um, <laughs> So let's talk a little bit about the Dragon Prince um, and creating the universe, and then we'll go into talking about uh, how our creative teams work on the, the universe of the Dragon Prince. So uh, there's the trailer, we showed it. Okay, so this is just some pretty art for me to put up here while I'm talking, it's not important, but it's very cool. These are all from the art book. You can buy it outside, uh, it's a plug. Um, so the Dragon Prince, we set up to be a different kind of fantasy and a different kind of world. So um, the pitch that we often hear people say when they're talking about the show, is that it's Game of Thrones for kids, uh, which is kind of a good way to put it, but we actually like to think of it as something slightly different, which is that, no, we're Game of Thrones for everybody. So we, we can be just as impactful and heartfelt and dark and deep as a Game of Thrones episode, but it's appropriate for all ages. And there might be children that watch it that don't understand the like underlying themes or the, sec the secret, dark, deep stuff, but it's all there, and so, that way you can attract you know, a, a show and a world that's for everybody, right? And we can represent as wide an audience as possible, whether that's kids or adults or people that are differently abled or different skin colors. And all of those things can be done with taste and reason and put into this show that anybody can possibly enjoy. And that way you can do what we were talking about in some of those things before. You can earn that empathy. You can earn that long-term trust with the audience because you're trying to be as em empathetic as possible. Um, and these are just some of the characters in the show. So we have all kinds of different stuff. We really pushed to make all our different regions of the world be not just some copy of from one to one of like a, a region in our world, but we tried to make them different. Uh, we have different elves and humans uh, and all different kinds of monsters and creatures and stuff like that. Um, Queen Anya is, is actually played by my co-founder's daughter. Uh, she's awesome, Queen Anya. Um, she has two mothers from the from the from Durin. Uh, people were really upset when they both died, but they're both awesome characters. Uh, we have Sunfire Elves. We have all kinds of stuff. Uh, they sacrificed themselves to keep her alive, and then she came back and saved the day at the end. Without her, nothing would have happened in season three. So, um, to talk quickly about Amaya, she is uh, a Death General. Um, she actually is. A, she's an amazing character. She's tough and just super badass. And she also signs everything. And so how do we do that? Um, that's crazy, by the way, if you're in an animation, people said, we told our, our studio that we were gonna make this character deaf and they were like, cool, so how are we gonna do that? And we were like, I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea how we're gonna do that. It meant that every single frame of her had to be counted as like three or four times the amount of animation budget because all of the hands had to work. They, they It's not just, the fact that the, that she's signing, it's that she was signing real things. 
Um, and that's when we also discovered that sign language in Canada and sign language in the US is not exactly the same. So we have to have multiple translators to make this work. Um, sign language is not a universal language at all. It's actually like an anti-universal language because of the way it works. Um, all, every different country and different region is different sign language. Um, and so we discovered this and we went super deep. We hired all kinds of people to help us out. We had people come, come into the office, talk to our animators, it gets translated through multiple people, um, and that's all so that we can have this authentic character on screen. Um, and she's not even in every episode. And so that's what we mean when we, we mean the commitment to authenticity. Um, and she's awesome. She has a whole amazing story arc in season four. Uh, she has, she's going to get married uh, to another Sunfire elf, the Janai, who's an amazing queen. There's all kinds of cool stuff going to happen. It's coming. It's in the trailer. It's okay. We've already released the clip. I'm not telling you anything you couldn't have found online. So... Um, so, <laughs> sorry, sorry, I should have said spoilers. Um, but yeah, she's awesome. She's an amazing character. So uh, it means we can do things like have these amazing epic posters, right? This dragon on the left and, and Erevos on the right there. But we also can do things like what we call heart and fart, right? So these are chibi comics that we've put out in the last few weeks, uh, which are super goofy and fun and they're delightful. And also they weren't made by us. They were made by an external artist who we saw their work, we loved them. We were like, are you interested in writing and stuff on the Dragon Prince? They came back and said yes, uh, and they delivered us these and a couple more. And we were like, this is amazing. So we got to work with this amazing person because we trusted that their vision of what the world of the Dragon Prince would translate to everybody, right? And we put that out on, uh, on our social media. So, um, so that's the world of the Dragon Prince. And just, that's a light touch. Anybody who's a big fan will know I didn't even get into a lot of the stuff that we're doing in the show. Um, season four is going to be uh, coming out next month. We're gonna announce a date this weekend, so get excited. Don't put that online. Don't put that online. Um, but yeah, it's, it's super exciting. Um, so the next section is working with creative teams. So we did all that stuff and we're tiny. Uh, Wonderstorm at the time we put the show out was 14 people total. And so, uh, and we managed to win an Emmy at going up against Disney and Nickelodeon, right? And so, how do we go? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That doesn't mean 14 people made the show, but it means that Wonderstorm was that size. So we have a, we actually work with a studio uh, called Bardell. They're up in Vancouver. Uh, they do all the animation. Um, we do art direction, writing, and production from our end. They do the animation, the rendering, and the lighting, and then we work together to sort of produce the piece that it is. Even then, they're a tiny team compared to what some of the bigger teams are that are out there. Um, so to make that show and make the thing that you all seem to love, uh, it means working with creative teams, which is very, very difficult. Um, I found this piece of stock art, and I just thought it was so ridiculous I had to put it in here as a break. So what the hell is happening here? Like, you've got <laughs> upside down graph of teamwork that this guy is working on. You've got a weird phone. It just, this is crazy. So you can look at this while I talk about what it takes to work with creative teams, because I thought it was so goofy. Um, so hiring outside the echo chamber, right? So it's really tempting to hire people that, that talk and think and act like you, right? Or, or things that you agree with. And that's fine, but you're not going to get your best stuff because everybody's going to agree. So you're going to have an echo chamber of ideas. You're not going to get things that are interesting or crazy or different. Um, or weird or whatever. And so what we go out of our way to do is make sure that when we're hiring people, that doesn't mean you can be a jerk, <laughs> right? It doesn't mean you're gonna hire people that are nasty, but it does mean we're gonna hire people that might disagree with our point of view on something or have a distinctive point of view about something that's completely different than what we've been talking about on the show or on the game or whatever. And by that, we end up having a huge group of ideas and, and things to pull from when we start making stuff. And so we try to hire what we call Swiss Army Knives, right? So we're a, a tiny company. So this is a little different than the advice I will give you coming out of school, but for what we do, we are generally speaking, I hate to say it, not hiring students because we don't have the time to train students properly. That's not to say there aren't tons of organizations that are hiring students fresh out of school, and we will be that organization someday. I'm gonna come back in five years and be like, who wants a job, hopefully, <laughs> uh, right? So, uh, but unfortunately that's not us today. And the reason why is because we have to go so fast and we are so small, we can't properly train people, which is a disservice to anybody that we would bring in, right? We don't wanna bring somebody in who's just gonna flail around and not know what they're doing and not be able to train them. So what we do is we try to hire Swiss Army Knights who have been around for a little while. So people that are interested in broad things. And that doesn't mean just not having two different skills. It means like, oh, like one of our writers is fascinated by Greek history, right? And every time we get into monster stuff, they're like, oh, it's like this Greek history thing, or it's like this other monster or this other thing. And they're just fascinated by it, right? And so they have this huge breadth of expertise in something 
that kind of doesn't really have anything to do with the show, but makes a huge difference when we actually are making the show, right? Our audio engineer loves mobster movies, loves them. He worked on The Sopranos, right? But he comes in and he says, well, how are we gonna make our combat sounds sound like something that's super awesome that would have been in The Sopranos without guns? And so he brings a completely different point of view to what we're doing. And he's been around forever. He's a million years old and he's the best. I love working with him. I've, I got to work with that Naughty Dog. We brought him in here. Um, and he's awesome. He brings a completely different point of view in. Um, let's see, where am I? Uh, driving vision and accepting changes. So actually, I'm going to move forward one slide just so you can see. This is an, a real creative office, not whatever that was. So this was the Wonderstorm office pre-COVID. Um, and so driving vision and accepting changes. So we expect people to do their best work, right? And that means a lot of times you got to respect what they're doing, even if it doesn't quite line up with what the original idea for the thing was. There are sometimes you have to hold the line. So as a creative producer or director or someone who's in charge, there are things that you know that need to go into the IP in a very specific way. Yeah. I know that game, Sign Our Wild Hearts. <laughs> I played that like all throughout spring. It's one of my favorite games ever. Awesome. So that guy right there worked on it. That's uh, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> That's why that's his background. Yeah. Oh, no problem. It's a great game. Everybody should play it. Was, it was put out by Annapurna. It's awesome. Uh, I think you can get it on iPhone, I think. Um, it's a great game. Anyway, uh, where was I? Driving vision, accepting changes. So it means trusting people to do their best work and accepting that their version might not quite be what you were thinking of. There are some times where you have to say no. There are some times where you're like, this is diametrically opposed to what we were trying to do here. And unfortunately, we need to change it. But a lot of times, like most of the time, the answer is like, yeah, that's pretty damn close. Let's do that. Your thing is super cool. That's different than what I was thinking, but it's awesome. And so managing creating teams is oftentimes about driving a vision to the team and then seeing what they come back with, right? Because if you're doing your job and driving that vision down through the entire organization and everybody's pushing in the same direction, they might come back with something different, but it's probably pretty close to what you've been trying to do the entire time, right? So it's trusting people to do that work and bring back something amazing. And then you gotta be okay with it a lot of the time. And that's okay. That's great. That's actually how great stuff gets made. Um, getting scrappy on a creative budget. Um, so here's a, a short example. So we were out of money for season two or one. I can't remember. We were out of money. We could not add anything else to an episode. We were just done. We were like, okay, you know, we're not going to have any extra budget. We can't make this as cool as we want. So we were like, well, how do we get two minutes worth of money out of a different episode so we can do what we want here? Right? How can we figure out? Because every minute just costs a flat amount. That's how animation works. It just costs money. And it's a set amount, pretty much. So you can kind of horse trade if you can make one episode cost a little less and one cost a little more. So we wanted to do something amazing for the end of season one, where it was the Wonderstorm. Wonderstorm is going to be really expensive. I don't remember why, but it was going to be a lot, a lot of money, which is, it's a big magical hurricane, basically. And they were like, we can't do this. We're like, we have to do this. The whole season's riding on it. It's got to be amazing. So how can we get two minutes back? So we looked back and we realized there's a sequence where Claudia and Soren go into a cave. We said, just make it black. Just make it pitch black. So you can't see anything. You can hear their voices, but they can't see anything. And just dim it way, way down. So they did that. So that sequence costs two minutes less of animation. And guess what? We put all that into that end, end of season one so that it mattered, right? And that's the kind of stuff you have to do every day when you have a tiny team because you just don't have the resources that the big players have. So you've got to do that and be constantly looking for those trade-offs. What matters, what doesn't? Frankly, episode one and episode nine matter than every, more, than every single episode in the entire season because people love the beginning and they need to love the end. Because without those two, it doesn't matter, right? So you gotta be willing to trade stuff in episode four for episode one or episode nine if you have to, right? Like, and that happens in the game all the time in game design. Is really worth the squeeze to fix this thing that's clearly a bug that 1% of people are gonna see? Probably not. It probably isn't. Maybe it is. If it crashes the game, you probably gotta fix it. But if it's just a piece of clipped collision, nope, it's not worth it. It's more important to take that time and fix the thing that's gonna everybody's gonna see, which is like there's a pop in this guy's cycle. We have to fix it. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter if we're done. You have to fix it. Um, so it's making those trade-offs. Um, the IP is our our IP. Hopefully, is built for gaming, right? And I've talked a little bit about this, but from the very very beginning, we decided to make a game alongside making this TV show, which meant. We actually went out and raised money to hire a game team with no publisher before we did anything else. So we, we sold the show to Netflix, we immediately raised money and immediately hired a game team. Even though we had no version, vision of what exactly that was other than we're gonna go make an awesome game. Um, and so because of that, 
the IP is like intricately linked into the game because it was created alongside at the same time. So hopefully when the game comes out and I can actually talk about it, you'll actually be able to see that and see how that's worked. Um, and this gets into my next thing, which is how does Wonderstorm work uh, and what, is, what does that mean for the future, right? So what is the future of IP development? So for anybody who doesn't know, does everybody know what IP is? It's intellectual property. Intellectual property is, the Dragon Prince is an intellectual property. Star Wars is intellectual property. Marvel is intellectual property, right? Creating original IP is the most rewarding and the hardest thing you can possibly do in Hollywood because nobody wants to let you do it. <laughs> they do not. Uh, especially this day and age, stuff costs a lot of money. It's much safer to make a Marvel sequel or something in the Star Wars universe than it is to make the Dragon Prince. And that's okay. That's just the way, the, and by the way, the world's kind of always been like that. It's always been super scary to make new stuff, right? And so because of that, oh, I, I'm going into my crystal ball you know, here, so you can take all this with a grain of salt. Um, but from, from our point of view, um, making IP is hard and selling it is even harder, right? Getting it made. I was talking to some of the students about this earlier. Just because you get something done and you sell it to somebody, you're not done yet. Nobody's seen it. You still have so many more leaps to get that out in front of the public that you have to constantly be in the mindset of how are we going to fight this thing forward? Every day, you're going to get kicked in the teeth. That's okay. I, I say that right now. They know that that's not okay every day. I just they come home and I'm like, oh my God, it's terrible, right? But you got to be willing to roll with it because that is how hard IP is. Like somebody asked me, how hard is it to sell an original property? Impossible was my answer. It is impossible because everybody wants to say no. So you have to believe more than anything else in the world that you are going to get this done and want it more than everybody else who's trying to do it because it's impossible because nobody wants to let you have it, right? And so making original IP is also super rewarding because you're putting your vision out there. So you gotta be crazy to do this for a living. It's the best job in the world, it's the worst job in the world, right? So what does the future look like? So from 2015 on, we've been saying at Wonderstorm, you need to make games and you need to make IP you need to make shows, all of those things need to be made by the same studio with the same people. Because that way what happens is you get truly authentic instantiations of that original property in all the different mediums that feel real. The terrible version of this is I license the Dragon Prince IP out to somebody, they make a match three game that has nothing to do with the Dragon Prince, everybody sees it and they go, that's terrible, and they never want to engage with our gaming properties again, right? That's the terrible version. The great version that has just started happening is this. Arcane, right? So, Arcane is awesome. We know all, I worked with a lot of the people that made Arcane. Arcane yeah. is an amazing series, like absolutely amazing. Super expensive, <laughs> very, very cool, right? But it was made by a gaming company, right? Netflix didn't make this game, or didn't make this, this show. League of Legends, or, or Riot made this show. And they made this show because they knew at the end of the day, they were not gonna make a dollar on this show. They, they could have lost money on the show, but they knew that this would drive people back into League of Legends and they would make money on League of Legends. So this became a labor of love because it didn't matter whether this made money or not. Now, it's really nice to be able to say that, right? It's really nice to be Riot, to have billions of dollars and be able to do that. But Dragon Prince is similar, right? We don't make any money on the show at all, none. Actually, we probably lose money technically on the show, but we believe so much in the promise of the IP that we know we will be able to make money elsewhere, right? That's why you can buy books, and that's why you can buy bait plushies, and that's why you can buy, hopefully, t-shirts soon, and Rayla costumes, and all this other stuff. And the reason that we believe that is because we think we can make a world that's so interesting and so cool that it can, it can support all of those things. And Riot does this better than anybody else. Like, Riot showed me that you can make an IP that people care deeply about, but also has great consumer products that people love, that aren't just garbage, right? That's why everything we make at Wonderstorm goes through one of our team members. We don't have anything just thrown over the wall. Our game, I worked on it. Our game designers, our board game, our game designers worked on it. Our graphic novels, I created the story. We worked directly with the artists. Our art book, I wrote the intro. Our writers wrote almost every single page, right? Everything we do, we try to make authentic, and they believe that a lot. The next one, I don't know if you've seen this. This is ridiculous. It's an amazing show. It's totally inappropriate for children, so do not show your children this show. But, oh, by the way, so is Arcane. Arcane is also not appropriate for children. Um, this show is awesome. It just came out. Guess what? They had their best day ever on Steam. Best day ever, the day that came out. So it's working, right? The flywheel works. If you make great stuff, and you make great games, and you make great worlds, it all works together, right? Super risky. That's why no one wants to give you any money to do that. But it's working and we're starting to see it in the market. The Witcher is another one, by the way. 
The Witcher came out. The show came out. The, show, the game went through the roof. The anime came out. The game went through the roof. The second season came out. The game went through the roof. That's a game that's nine years old, eight years old at this point, and they're selling new copies every week because the show is great. Now, what would have happened if Arcane or Edge Runners or you know The Witcher had not been good, right? It would have been actually worse. It would have been detrimental to the game. So that's why everybody is terrified of doing it. But you have to be super brave in order to do these things and make them great, and you will win, right? That's a lot of what we believe. Um, so what's next for us? And how are we gonna, now I've just told you making IP is impossible. Why are we continuing to do it? And I told you because it's amazing, right? It's an amazing thing. It's a great job if you can afford to do it. So if we know that everybody doesn't want to, to give you money to create your IPs, you have to turn them into a groundswell yourself, right? You have to make it happen. So what do we do? We went out and got Scrappy and we made a new IP that's called, this is called, okay. Can we turn off the camera for this? This is the part I can't show. That is sort of the end of my spiel here. I think before we do QA, there's, we're gonna collect cards, is that right? Okay, so we're gonna collect cards and take a pause and then we're gonna do Q&A, so. Hi everybody, I'm Derek Hoffend, the director of the Game Design and Immersive Technologies program here at Leslie University. Woo! And, um, while they're reading over with questions, maybe I can come up with something, I don't know. Justin, thanks for joining us, this is so great. Uh, Audience is clearly super excited. You've got a lot of enthusiastic fans here um, giving us a lot to think about. So I was thinking of some things yeah. while watching. Um, I'll ask you, so thinking about your transition from, thank you, from game design work to animation slash film, what would be, I mean, they're parallel but different career paths, right? There's things that are similar, a lot of things that are very different. Could you talk about some of the things that help with that transition that worked for, and maybe some of the things that were very different. So how did you go from game design to animation film, carry the skill set over from one into the other, right? Because that is a big different, uh, different career jump with a whole different set of problems, right? So um, think about that a little bit. So, uh, can you go to the Yeah. Oh, let's just create places. Like yeah. That. All right. Is this better? Yeah? yeah. All right. Um, so what what were the challenges or differences between switching from video games to animation? So, I mean, I had one advantage, which is that I went to animation school and worked as an animator for a few years, and then I stopped doing it. So that, that helped, right? So I had a baseline understanding of how animation works. Um, my understanding of animation, though, was very much geared to the video game world. Um, I had made that one short, but most almost my entire career in animation, or my entire career in paid animation anyway, was in video games, which are very, very different um, in terms of their requirements, right? Like oftentimes, especially real-time animations, they have to look good from three, 360. You can't cheat like you can uh, in, in 3D animation uh, for linear, stuff like that. So, um, so I had some sort of baseline rules built in. Um, the big, some of the big difference between game design and, and animation or linear is that, um, Linear, especially when you're getting paid for it, is highly regimented by time, um, down to pretty much the day. Like I can tell you right now, if I looked at the schedule, I can tell you what day we finish animating or rendering episode 709. Like I can tell you literally to the day because you roll teams off and on uh, of projects by week. And so you have to be highly, highly regimented with how you deliver or you end up costing yourself a fortune. Because the way animation works, uh, once you get into real productions is, you don't, like, it's very, very expensive to make one season of animation. The way you amortize the cost is you actually build three seasons at, or however many episodes you're doing kind of at the same time back to back to back. And that way, the period of time where people ramp onto the project and ramp off the project is the narrowest, right? So most of the time, most of the people are on the project. That's how you save the most amount of money because those shoulders are what absolutely kill you because they drag the project out for longer. And so you have to be highly, highly regimented about when you deliver, like writing has to be done on a specific day. Voice acting has to be done on a specific day. You can't give notes on certain kinds of things at certain times, right? Like you cannot give animatic style notes on something that's fully rendered or people will kill you, right? It just won't work. And so that's very different than game design where finding something fun is like, I don't know, maybe next Thursday, maybe next Wednesday. I don't know, it could be a month from now, it could be a year from now. So how do you, how do you work in a process that's highly, highly collaborative, but also in game design anyway, it's totally unclear as to when you're, you're quote unquote done, right? As to when something is fun enough or good enough or you know, done enough to move into full production. And so that was really, really challenging to go from animation to that where I was like highly used to just schedule. Whereas game design, it was like, 
people play your stuff and they're like, yeah, it's, it's not good. <laughs> That's not fun. I don't, I don't like that. Um, or that mechanic is totally incomprehensible. And you're like, well, I put this whole tutorial together. And they're like, yeah, I don't care. It doesn't matter. I have no idea how it works. And so you have to spend a lot more time iterating. And then once you're done iterating though, depending on the type of game and what you're making, um, you can go super fast. Like you spend way more time up front, way less time at the end. Animation's the other way where it's like, you're just completely even throughout the process. You know exactly how it's going. So does that kind of answer the question? Yeah, okay. great. Cool. Thanks a lot. All right. All right, now I have lots of cards, probably okay, way exactly. too many questions. Okay. And each of these cards has multiple questions. Good, all right. So we'll, I don't know what to do about that. <laughs> uh, how much involvement did Netflix have in the creative process? I'm going to throw you three questions at once. Can okay. you handle it? Go all three and then I'll, yeah, we'll back. Why are the moon shadow elves Scottish? <laughs> okay. Always a good question. Okay. Was bait originally another animal? Mm. Okay, first question. How much create, what was it? How much? How much involvement did Netflix involvement have in the so creative process? Netflix is in some ways amazing to work with because what they do is they're like, we don't have time to worry about you. We have 800, 800 million shows. Here's a bunch of money, go make a thing. Uh, and so, which is amazing, right? Now they do give notes. They do, that, I'm being a little facetious. They, they absolutely care, right? They care what you're making. They care that you're making something cool or good or that you at least think is good. And so they didn't, oh, sorry. Uh, they didn't get, we didn't get, creative notes, like we would get more like production style notes where it's like, hey, you guys are coming in late on the boards here. Like, how are we gonna catch up time? We would get stuff like that. A lot more like production heavy. We would get occasional notes on like a shot or two or like a specific moment in the script where it's like, I didn't quite understand what's happening here. But generally speaking, Netflix is pretty hands off. Um, and that's kind of the deal is like, they give you some money, you get to make a thing, they may or may not market it, right? And so uh, a lot of it is on you as the creators or, or the studio to sort of make all that stuff happen. So two, why are this Mugello of Scottish? Because Ian Henry, who is one of our lead writers and creative designers, is Scottish. And his wife is the lead writer on the show. Um, and so we just really liked the accent. We thought it was great. And then we were when we were casting, um, we, got, uh, we got Paula Burroughs um, in. It was her first show. She'd never done it before. She came in and just killed it, like knocked it completely out of the park. We're like, I guess that's it. Moon Shadow Elves are Scottish. Um, and so from then on, all the other, that, that sort of forced our casting hand from then on with all the Moon Shadow Elves. Um, so we got Jason, uh, I'm blanking on his last name. The guy who plays Renan, he's amazing. Sorry, Jason, Jason, not Simpson. Jason Simpson's Viren. Jason, oh, look it up later. He's amazing. I'm so sorry, Jason. Uh, he's great. He plays Renan. Um, and then what's the last one? Bait one. was bait, bait, ever was bait a different animal? character? No. So bait was always a lizard uh, from the very, very, very beginning. Um, but he was specifically designed to be a cross between my Boston Terrier and a bulldog. Um, <laughs> so that's where he comes from. And then his name was a joke between uh, Devin and I. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Let's play our own little game here. Oh, have you pick I'm between? Pick one. All right. Yeah. Why not? Any advice to aspiring fantasy writers to help develop their characters and worlds? Oh, that's a good one. Um, any advice for um, So, I mean, it's, it's stay true. Like, if you have an idea for a world or a character or whatever, it's like try to stay too, true to the original thing that you thought was interesting about it if it still rings true to you. So when you're writing, it can be really easy to be like, new shiny thing over here, new shiny thing over here, right? Like, but there was something that attracted you to the idea originally and generally speaking for me anyway that's the most exciting thing that will carry me through a process so trying to figure out what that thing is for you and then stay true to that and develop that right it might be a character it might be like i'm really interested into this moonshadow elf that can swing from trees with her cool fancy blades and then that becomes an entire society in your in your in your story or it becomes a piece of the world right like i have a friend who worked on a, a game where the whole premise I don't think the game ever came out, but the whole premise was what if the earth was tidal locked, which means it can't rotate, right? What happens? And so then he went down this crazy rabbit hole and he's like, wow, the earth would be totally terrible if that happened um, and decided to try making a game about that and got obsessed with that idea, right? So stay true to the thing that you find interesting and then get that out of your system and get that into the world as fast as possible. All right. All right. Another one. It's going to go like this. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, this one's got oh, another multi-card. Why did you make the show 3D? How did you come up with a story for the show? And how did you go from video games to animation? And we may have already covered that a little bit. Okay, so why do we make the show 3D? Um, 
couple things. We love Miyazaki. We love 2D animation. We love anime. Uh, all that stuff's super expensive. <laughs> uh, it is very, very difficult to make a show that looks hand-drawn like that, um, especially this day and age. Like, Miyazaki has a hard time making shows like that now. And so, um, budgetarily, we didn't have a choice. Like, I would have loved to make a 2D show that looks like The Dragon Prince. Um, it would have been impossible. It would have cost way, way too much money, which is, by the way, the reality of productions, right? You have an idea in your head, and then somebody says, you have this amount of money. You can either make it or you don't. It's up to you. And you go, yeah, I'm going to make the thing. We'll figure it out. So um, what we decided to do was go with Bardell. They had made a movie called The Prophet. Uh, they had a rendering technology that is what we used in the show. Um, we, I really like the look of the show, but a lot of what we did in working on, on the rendering technology was to put in all these things like face masks and stuff. So... In traditional uh, 3D animation, when you're running past a light, right, the shadows will crawl all over the place because that's how toon shaders work. Um, and we didn't love that. And so what we did is every single shot where you see their faces in particular, uh, there's actually a render mask for where the light's coming from and what's in shadow. And that way the compositors, when they're, when they're comping the shots together, can actually pick which maps are on and off. Um, and that, that gives us a look for the show. But it was, it was something that we think came out awesome, but it was a production reality of how we had to actually create it. That was one. Was two. Yeah. Um, how did you come up with the story um, in general? Aaron and I were talking about magic system. Like, well, there was two things. One was magic systems. Like, what if there was a shortcut magic and a long cut magic, basically? And that's where sort of dark magic came from, which was like, well, what if you could do primal magic, but what if there's this other shortcut way and that other shortcut way was like super morally reprehensible? Um, but what if there was a reason you had to do that? Like, what if you could only do magic that way? What if... What if everybody else could do this kind of magic, but, but humans had to do this kind of magic, right? So that's where that sort of came from. That was one of the first things. And then the second thing was we were talking about generational conflict, right? The idea of, you know, if you're born into a conflict that was happening long before you were born, like how do you break the cycle of violence? How do you, as a young person, break out of that? How do you, how do you become a better person? How do you change society, right? Especially if you're in a position to be able to do that. Um, and so that's where the like sort of Ezra and Cal and Rayla storyline came from. Right. And then how did you go from video games to animation? Uh, um, like I, I think we sort of talked about it. I was yeah. an animator before, um, and Aaron and I just sort of talking, started talking about the show. And, um, and I still spend, by the way, like 90% of my day working on the video game. <laughs> All right. Next card. You can't read it. I can't read it. Um, this person is a huge Uncharted fan. Oh, sweet. Do you have any tips for getting a job in 3D animation for film and games? Um, that's a good question. So they're, they're sort of different. So for film, um, learn how to use mocap, learn how to clean up mocap, uh, learn how to do match moving, like spend your time. If you want to work in film, like you need to spend time working with technologies that allow you to render and, and make animations that look real, right? That, that look like they're made by a human or made by a special effects or whatever. And so, um, so that's, it's like looking into like, especially learning how mocap works and mocap cleanup works. If you want to work in film, it's a requirement. Like you can still do hand key stuff, but you're definitely going to do that. For games, it's important to get in real time cycles. So uh, run and walk and all the things you would do in traditional animation, but that look good from a 360 because like player animations and, and enemy animations almost always can be seen from any angle at any time. So you need to get really good at being able to make those kinds of animations that don't look janky, no matter which way you're looking at them. And then in terms of getting a job, it's get an awesome reel together and then apply everywhere. <laughs> I applied to, I don't know what, hundreds of jobs before I got a job. So, um, yeah. Just say anything else about the reel by any chance while we're on that? Oh, sure. Um, put your strongest stuff, I mean, this is the stuff you guys have probably all heard, but put your strongest stuff up front. Do not be afraid to not show something that's bad. Uh, even if you have a piece of work, but you're like, this is not as good as I can do, do not put it on your reel. You are better showing one super awesome animation than showing five mediocre ones. Um, and then make, also make sure that your best stuff is up front, that your name and phone number and email address and website are on your reel, on the first screen. Uh, get an art station page or whatever, you know, is that what we're using now? I don't even know anymore. Get whatever page is free that you can put a reel up on where I can go find you. Uh, put that on your resume, keep it up to date. Um, do not write a generic uh, uh, intro, what do you call them? Intro letter, what's that called? Cover letter, Cover letter. thank you. Yeah. Try to customize that a little bit for the, for the, I know it's a pain, but try to put something in there that suggests you even know what this company does. I can't tell you how many times I've gotten letters that are clearly for other companies. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I don't know, man, really? Am I really going to look at this? But out of all that stuff, the only thing that matters is the real. So if I am opening the real as a recruiter, 
I better be able to look at that thing and go like, the, the lead animator needs to look at this right now, right? That's, that's your goal, is to try and get that done. Um, so that, that is what I would do. And then, by the way, it doesn't mean just animation, it's like effects, it applies to any kind of artistic reel, character design reels, whatever, all that stuff. Um, if you're a 3D artist, um, make sure you do turnarounds with wireframes, make sure you show UV sets, make sure you show all the different shaders you did. Um, there's a great plugin now for some of these websites where you actually can see the shade, like learn PBR, 100% learn PBR, which is physically based rendering. Uh, everybody uses it, right? Like everybody, uh, even Giant Prince, I mean, sorry, uh, Bonders uses PBR. So uh, it doesn't have to be realistic to be PBR. It just, it's a type of rendering, look into it. Super important, especially in games. And movies. As long as that's not Paps Blue Ribbon, <laughs> right? Oh, wow. Okay. What do you wish you did when you were in college that may have helped you get here? Um, okay. From the perspective from someone in the industry, oh, this is actually a second part of the question. Let's just start there. Okay. There's a lot of, what did you wish, what do you wish you did when you were in college that may have helped you get here? What do you wish you did? I don't know, man. That's a hard question. I think everybody has a different path into the industry. Um, you know, it's like, one of my friends in comics always says like, you know, he gets asked, how do I get into comic books? How do, I, how do I get to write comic books or make comic books? And he's like, every single person who gets in here, there's a door for them and then that door closes, <laughs> right? And there's all kinds of other doors, but that one door is gone. So um, a lot of it is, for me, is about trying to, to really concentrate on making something awesome, even if that thing is small. So like, uh, you know, someone told me this after college, which I know, which I know in art school was, don't try to make your magnum opus in art school. Like don't. It's a bad idea because A, it's gonna drive you crazy. It's gonna, you're gonna be, feel terrible about it because it's not gonna come out how you thought it would. Try to make something great for now, right? Try to make something really, really cool, but don't try to make the thing that's been in your head for like 20 years because you will be able to do that someday, but you probably don't have the skills at this point in your career to be able to do the thing that matches what's in your brain. Um, and it'll drive you freaking crazy. If you put it out, you're like, man, I don't like that. Oh, it's terrible, right? Don't do that. Um, so I guess slightly different on the writing side, you can do that. But on, on the animation side uh, or on the VFX side, definitely do not try to do that. All right, I'll give you the second part to the card. Right. From the perspective of someone in the industry, what do people in the business of entertainment want to see more of in animation when it comes to both the art and the story itself? Oh, yeah, that's a big that's one. That's a big question. Um, in terms of getting your first job, it doesn't matter. It just has to be great animation, right? It can be, it can be literally anything. So if you have a great reel of like running and jumping and some, fa some facial animation and it's fantastic, like I'll look at that and go, awesome, let's get this person in here for an interview. So it, in that sense, like a reel doesn't have to be any kind of like coherent piece of work necessarily. It can totally be a mishmash of stuff, but if it's all there and all great, I'm, I'm super on board. Uh, a lot of companies will test you anyway. So that your, your step is generally speaking is like have a reel, Get someone to look at your animations, then you're probably gonna have to do a test. Do the best you can on the test. It's usually timed. Uh, and then hopefully you're getting the interview from there. Um, and so that's sort of the goal. Sometimes you'll have an interview before the, before the test. Um, what was the second part? There's another piece of this. It was, um, what do people in the business of entertainment wanna see more of an animation? I don't know, tell that's me, please. <laughs> I will go sell whatever tell that is. Tell this person yeah, right here. Exactly, yeah, tell me. Um, you can't think like that. Uh, you have to make the thing that you think is awesome because A, Hollywood's cyclical and nobody knows anything, for real. Nobody knows anything. So make what you think is awesome and make it awesome and you'll probably be able to sell it. Or maybe not, depends. That's good advice. <laughs> Let's just ask a time check real quick. How are we doing on I'm question? Fine. I'll go all night. Because so. we're not even halfway through the cards. How much, when should we end? 820. We'll just, keep going. we'll just keep going until they say, all right, we'll be, we'll be one person left and we'll, be, we'll still be going. Uh, were you more involved in writing or visual development? I don't... For which? For um, who wrote that card? Anybody want to raise their hand? Wait, what did you say? Were you more involved in writing or visual development? Yeah, that was me. Okay, well, how do you mean? Um, I know like for visual development, it can usually mean like character design or like, or like a concept or for like environments, props, and then writing, so I want to know like what were you more hands-on in, but I think we kind of talked about it earlier. I, I mean, so like truly hands-on, like I wrote half the scripts for The Dragon Prince with Aaron, right? So he and I co-wrote, I don't even know how many episodes, a lot of the episodes. Um, for visual development, uh, we, Aaron and I have final say, I guess, but a lot of it we trust to the visual development artists that we have at Bardell or, or CT Chrysler who works at the company. 
Um, oftentimes with CT, because he's internal and we've worked for him a long time, worked with him a long time, we can be like, hey, CT, we're kind of thinking of something like this. You know, I don't know, what do you think? And then he draws something awesome and you're like, yeah, that's a million times better than whatever we just said. And so we'll go with that. Um, when it's more precise or if there's something that's very precise, we can get you know down to the nitty gritty where it's like, this has to look like this so that people understand what it is in the show for some reason, then we'll go pretty hard uh, and try to figure that out. But um, in terms of truly hands-on, like I'm not drawing anything in the show. Thank God, because I'm a terrible artist. Okay, following up on visual development, what's a great way to break into the anim animation industry as a visual developer? Visual development, like character, de character development, you mean? Or? So they're generally speaking, viz dev people, um, there aren't a lot of true viz dev jobs. Like it's actually really difficult to find those jobs because they're highly specific and they tend to be very, very high level. Like a lot of the visual development artists that you'll see online are people that have been doing this for like 30 years. The way in there oftentimes is either through a background artist or a, a character artist, depending on what you're more interested in. So if you wanna do like character development designs, like get, get a great reel or, or portfolio together of character designs, right? Or if you wanna do backgrounds, then, then do that. I would have a portfolio, honestly, when you're coming out, I'd have a portfolio of both. Um, and show a pretty good range. Like a lot of what visible development is, is being able to do a lot of styles and work pretty quickly. Um, like once you get through your career, you can start to be like, well, I'm this person and this is what my style is and do you want me or not? But when you're young, it's super helpful to be able to be able to do a lot of different stuff because it means you can be hired by a lot of different studios. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, cool. This is a big one. Okay. It's a short one, but a big one. What's the key to writing a great story? Oh, geez. You tell me. Uh, no, it's, it's character, right? Great characters and great stories. I mean, it's, it's almost a hundred percent true. I mean, I'm sure there's some example that someone can give me that's not, but it's having great characters, generally speaking, means you can have a great story. All right, let's do the next one. Oh, right. All right. How do you approach the world building for the series? Was there anything that specifically inspired it? Oh yeah, a million things. I mean, so... Uh, how do we approach the world building? I mean, it depends on what the thing is. Um, when we're writing something that's very specific, oftentimes we'll all come in with an idea, or Aaron will come in with an idea, or one of the writers will come with an idea, and we'll be like, okay, you know, we need, we need a sequence that, does, that emotionally does X, right? So in season three, uh, there's a sequence where, uh, I'm gonna spoil some stuff, where the, the queen, uh, Janai's mother, uh, or sorry, sister um, gets killed, basically. And we wanted her to be very, very high up in the air when this happened. So we knew that we had this sort of idea of how the sun worked in the Sun Elf Society. And we knew that we wanted these solar reflectors. And we were like, how does this kind of work? So we went and looked at solar collector farms, right? And so that's kind of what we did with, the, with that world is like in, in the Sunfire community, we sort of built what would a fantasy solar collector look like. So we went out and just found sort of real world examples and then magic it up, is, is for lack of a better word. And then we let the artists go crazy. We're like, make this look awesome. I don't know, it's a pillar with some stuff, you know? And then they did an amazing job. Um, we sort of described how it kind of would work and then they, they went crazy. Um, so that's sort of how the world, world building tends to work. It tends to be something that comes from somewhere else completely, for me anyway, where I'm like, oh, that you know, spiral staircase on that piece of architecture looks amazing. Like, let's work that in somehow. You know, that would be perfect for this trap we're working on or, or what have you. Um, was there another part of that? No. No, all right, good. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> all right. This one has a smiley face, sweet. Smiley face. How do you brainstorm the start of an IP? Oh. <laughs> another simple question. Uh, for, for, I mean, I told you sort of how we did it with Dragon Prince, which was like sort of this idea, like, that one was really big. Like thinking back, like that sounds really heady. It's like generational conflict. Like, oh man, that's heavy. Like, wow. That's not how most of our stuff starts. Most of our stuff starts like, what if there was this cool thing and then another cool thing happened? <laughs> and they're like, oh yeah, that sounds awesome. So like Bonders, right? Bonders was, um, we were like, man, Harry Potter's cool, but there's not really a sci-fi Harry Potter. That was like part of it, right? So that was kind of a big idea. But then the, the bigger one was like, wouldn't it be cool if you had a digital pet that you could like carry around with you and it kind of reflected your personality and like kind of messed with you. And like we looked at, um, or we had both read uh, Golden Compass, which has the, um, uh, the Lyra and Pantalimon. I can't think of their names. The Demons. Steve Damons, yes, thank you. Damons, thank you. Um, and so we're like, those are really cool, but they're, they're kind of different. And so then we sort of got into this idea of like, okay, well, if you have this digital pet, and it can kind of mess with you, like, what, what does that world look like? Why does that even exist? Why is that a thing? 
And then we got into this thing, which was like Jimenez Sanchez, who's the, the professor in the, in the short, the whole idea is like, what if you were obsessed with artificial intelligence, right? What if, what if you were totally obsessed with that? How could you make a really cool version of artificial intelligence that isn't killer robot monsters? And pets was the immediate thing we thought of. And so that's where all that sort of started to come together. And then it was like, okay, well now what are the characters? Because all that's just world building, who's gonna care? And then we got into the stuff with uh, Tyler and Edison. And then the rest of the, there's like five other kids that are sort of main protagonists, this sort of ragtag crew, and they all have backstories and stuff. Okay. Yeah. So I'm told there's one more question. Oh, I'll be out there though. So and you can, you can ask Justin more questions outside. From the top. Oh, From the top. Oh, Jesus. All right. This is smart. You people are smart. Squeezing in 10 questions. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, exactly. Two it's inches. Like, that cheat sheet, like, oh, you can bring as many questions. Yeah. As you want. I thought people were taking notes, but they were actually writing essay long questions. Yeah, exactly. um, what's it like to be a co creator of Netflix Dragon Prince? How did you get hired? How do you get hired? I'm sorry. What program was the Dragon's, uh, Dragon Prince made in? Cool. Um, it feels great. I don't know. It's awesome. It's the best job ever, right? It's ridiculous. It's make stuff up and then people put it on screen for you. It's, it's amazing. Uh, it's super hard, right? Like being, being a co-founder uh, and a co-creator means you spend like 80 or 90% of your time doing something you don't want to do, which is totally fine. Like I, I bought that off, but it's super hard, right? Like, like I said, just getting someone to say yes is hard. Getting it all the way through the process is, is also super difficult. So, um, but I love it. I love, I love the team I work with. I love our crew. Um, I'm super blessed to get to work with the people I work with every day. So that's awesome. What was two? Part two is how do you get hired? I, I think you may have I, I kind of covered started, some of that yeah. a few different I don't angles really, I mean, maybe. As a writer, that's why we didn't talk about how do I get hired as a writer. Uh, have an amazing sample. Keep your samples up to date. Keep writing. Keep making new stuff with your samples. Put it into a website where people can get at it if you possibly can. Um, and then try to get it read. That, that's like the number one. That's like Earlier you had a tip about not giving this huge long story, but keeping a short. Oh yeah, don't, maybe that's okay, a good so pointer. do not go write a season of something unless you want to do it for fun as like a practice. No one will read it. And, no, and also by the way, it's, it's actually poor form because people who are spending you know, millions of dollars on a thing want to have a say. And they want to believe that they helped you drive this vision. And so even if they didn't, and so, um, and oftentimes, by the way, they did. Great creative, great creative notes from executives can change entire episodes or entire seasons, right? Like we've gotten notes on the Dragon Prince from people that were like, holy, that is super smart. We need to do that immediately. Um, so the way you do it is you write a treatment, which is like a page and a half, maybe two pages of what you're trying to do, whether it's a TV show, it's a TV show, you need to have a, uh, like either the engine needs to be in there, which is what you call uh, the weekly, right? If it's a monster of the week, you better have that in that, in that premise or in that treatment. Um, if it's a movie, then it's the whole story. Uh, if it's a seasonal show, like what the out, the kind of what the arc of that first season is, what's going to hook them. And then you write a pilot, uh, and you write the best possible pilot you possibly can. That's enough. That's it. Do not write any more. Go, you are better off writing a second series, a second pilot, a second treatment, and then a third pilot, a third, rather than write more episodes of the thing that you just did, because a, no one's going to read them and B those things have a shelf life. And once somebody's read them, they're gone forever. And so you're not gonna sell it. So keep writing new stuff rather than going back and circling in the same stuff. By the way, when you get super famous, you can go make all that stuff that you threw out, right? But you're not gonna get it read multiple years in a row because that's just not how, they, as soon as someone recognizes they've read something, it's in the trash, right? So just make new stuff and make it great. What's the last one? Great advice, thanks. The last part was a te technical question. What program was the Dragon oh, Prince made in? Um, a lot of programs. <laughs> so. Uh, we animate in Maya. Um, the artists can re can model in anything, so they model in Blender and 3D Max, and and Maya. Uh, all the animation is done in Maya. All the rigs are in Maya. Uh, the rendering is a super technical plugin for RenderMan, uh, which has come from Japan for anime, came from, out of an anime studio. Uh, what else? I think. And then you know, there's all the other like weird stuff like like uh, Mudbox and what are the other ones like Mudbox? Like all the all the like paint on programs, substance, right? Got any suggestions, Kermit? <laughs> right, am I getting them all? All the stuff to like paint Render on Render engines. Models, all those. ZBrush, right, ZBrush. Uh, Blender, Blender's actually becoming super popular because it's free um, and there's tons of plugins for it. Um, so all that stuff. But really at the end of the day, software is just a tool, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter, if you know how to use any of them, you'll figure, I mean, I picked up Blender in like a week and I knew Maya, right? Like it's, it is not hard to pick up other tools. Fundamentals are the things that matter. That's what you got to get down now. All right. I think that's a wrap. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.